and welcome to Conversations With. I'm Courtney. And I'm Keith. And we are the clinical team here at Burton's Academy. With our combined passion for monitoring and ventilation, we're here to rewind and remind you on the foundations and principles used to form the knowledge and understanding in everyday anaesthesia. And this week's episode, we're talking about ECGs. And I have Courtney Scales with me here. Uh, Courtney, I know we're going to talk about ECGs, and I think there's a, there's an awful lot we could talk about with ECGs. We could talk about the morphology, the complexes, and we could talk about what they mean and how they vary from normal, and all sorts of aspects of that. But I think our our focus this week is going to be on getting a good ECG trace. In other words, you know, when you come to do an ECG, whether it's for monitoring or whether it's for um, diagnostic purposes, What's going to make or break um, the success of that is getting actually a nice trace on your um, on your screen or on your paper. So I think that we're going to focus on that. Is that um, that's something you can sort of start this process off because it, it's a it's, it's kind of an involved process, isn't it? You, you know, you can't you, well, you can just put the electrodes on uh, and hope for the best, but I think there's a lot of there's a lot of steps between doing that and actually getting a good reliable trace. So would you like to sort of start us off on on you know, that path to how we get a good ECG trace? Yeah, absolutely. I love the topic of ECGs. I love talking about the machine. I love talking about different types of arrhythmias and all the information it tells us. Um, but just like you said, it's not a matter of plugging in the machine and just away we go. There's so many parts to the machine and it starts right down at the patient level with the electrode placement, um, how we need to make sure that our cables are laying around the placement, uh, around the patient, sorry, what setting we have the ECG machine to and how to troubleshoot. You know, it's not just troubleshooting the arrhythmia that you are seeing in the patient. It's how to make sure that you can confirm that there actually is an arrhythmia, not just a bunch of electrical interference. So I am um, quite like just teaching and talking about how to set up the ECG machine in a way that you're going to get something trustworthy. So um, a trustworthy trace. And um, so Essentially, I think if we start down way down at the patient level and just talk about the electrodes that we attach to the patients. So these we're, we're placing these electrodes on the skin to try and get what I like to when I think about ECGs is we've got this electrical activity in the heart and that is measurable, but we're not really going to invasively you know, open up the thorax and place a voltimeter around the heart to look at the electricity and the direction and the pathway that it travels on. So I kind of like to think of it almost like a ripple effect. If we can put these ECGs on the patient's skin, when there is some activity within the heart, the electrical activity, that does actually con conduct all the way through out to the outside of the patient. And that's what we end up picking it up on. Um, and we do that by the electrodes that we place on our patient. And we have such a big range of electrodes available. Um, I think most people will probably be familiar with their adhesive pads that you can stick to the pore pads, um, a furless area. So I've even stuck those on the ears, you know, in the pinner of the ears. I've stuck them on the nose of a patient before. Um, so we have those really common ECG pads. And then we also have crocodile clips that we have as well. So you can get them as atraumatic, but those are the clips that bite the skin. Um, and then we also have limb plates that we can use and they're kind of like a bracelet that goes onto the patient's limbs uh, with a metal pad. We put a bit of conductive gel there. Um, we have hypodermic needles that we can put through the patient's skin um, and attach our kind of crocodile clips to that. And that's really good for birds or, or something where you don't want to go and put a big traumatic clip on or um, adhesive pad. And then we also have the esophageal ECG. So there's a range of these electrodes available um, but it's not just a matter of putting them on, taping them on, and away we go. And I think it's really important that when we want to get that super fine signal that has managed to reach the surface of our patient from their heart, it's really good that we eliminate as much interference as possible so that we can get a good reading. Um, and we can also help our machine by making a bit of contact to our patient as well. So I think it's really important that when we are placing electrodes on, we're thinking about perhaps if we're talking about the sticky adhesive and we're going to stick them onto the patient's pore pads, are they dirty and greasy? Do we need to clean the skin just to eliminate some of that resistance before we put the electrode on, um, the adhesive electrode on? Or even if we're doing the, um, you know, fur, it's this natural insulator to our patient but also it's going to create a lot of interference we're not going to get this nice fine electrical signal from the patient's heart going all the way out to their 
um, their skin and then it's going to also go through their fur. It's not going to do that. So that's why we use things like spirit and electro gel just to help make better contact between our patient's skin and um, the electrode. So we, we have, yeah, we have the electrodes, nice and simple and easy. Um, and then we also need to then attach those electrodes to the cables. Um, but it's not just a matter of plugging in the cables to those electrodes and just seeing what happens as well. Then we have to delve into things like something called common mode rejection and making sure that all of our cables see the same path so that they're not lying like a spaghetti junction around the patient. They're... Um, they're all lined up very nicely. And that way, if there's any interference in the room, you know, if you think about your phones that you've got, uh, we're in a really advanced state of medicine where we've got equipment and machines everywhere. And though they have electricity going through them, they also are going to impact and interfere with that fine um, voltage that we're trying to read off our patient's surface, you know, skin surface. So should we, how should we be laying our cables? So that's kind of what I wanted to go through today. It was just setting up your machine properly so that you know how to get a trustworthy trace. Okay. So I think from what you're saying that the, the you know, we've got a nice ECG signal inside the patient and it might mix its way to the, towards the skin surface, you know, through the, all the readily conductible areas of the body, but it arrives at the skin. And I think what you're saying is that's the first barrier and we've got to kind of overcome that barrier the first thing we want to do is overcome that that barrier because if we don't, we're not going to get get a good signal. Is that, is that yeah, absolutely. Saying? We we know we're going to get a signal all the way to the skin. We, there's not really much we can do. We can't strip that. We know that the body is it's quite it will readily um, the the signal will transfer through the body nice and easy. It's one big you know nice medium of flesh, and uh, it's once it gets to the skin that's when we're going to start to have problems. And we can't do anything about the patient's body. You know, we're not going to strip back and try and place a voltmeter around the heart, like I said. So we really need to make sure that the environment that the electrodes are on are with as least resistance or as least amount of interference as possible. So I think you can, a lot of gel and a lot of spirit for these, all the different types of attachments that we have. Yeah. So are you would you advocate cleaning? And if you get like a, you know, some of these uh, dogs kind of, fairly greasy axilla or or, um, uh, or skin folds. Would you advocate maybe cleaning those before you place the, the electrodes? Does that kind of help? Yeah, I think some of that kind of oil and dirt that, you know, they might have on their skin, you can absolutely give it a bit of a clean. Um, and even with that being wet as well, with the fur being wet, it's going to help make contact with whatever type of electrode that you have. If you have the sticky adhesive electrodes and you want to put it on a patient's paw, but perhaps it's an emergency, they've been running in the dog park, they've got a stick injury, but they're also quite muddy. If you then go and try and put your um, adhesive electrode onto their paw pad, it's not going to be able to read very well through that dirt. It's just going to interfere with our, uh, with our signal and create quite a lot of resistance. So in those instances, I would just give the pore pads a little bit of a clean before I then attached my electrode. Um, and the same thing with the patient's fur as well. I, I'm hesitant to go as far as saying we should clip all of the fur off around their armpits so that we can put our ECG in. We should instead, you know, open up our crocodile clip put a lot of um, electro gel in our crocodile clip before we put it onto our patient and then put a bit of spirit in there to dampen down the fur as well. well I think <clears throat> what you're saying then is, you know, we've got this obstacle and there are a lot, lot of ways to overcome it. And I think then you said something quite interesting. Once once that signals into those cables and it's starting to pass up to, to the ECG machine, it's not just a matter of connecting them. We've, we've got to take care about the way those cables are organised. Um, and you mentioned something called common mode rejection. Is that, is that something that that's not, it's not something I was taught at uh, university and I don't expect many of the nurses are, but what does that mean in practical terms? What does it, does it mean for, for someone trying to get a good ECG? So we've got, we've got them well placed on the animal. We've reduced our skin resistance by all these you know, cleaning and um, preparation techniques. So now we're dealing with uh, getting that signal cleanly up to the machine. So, so what, what was the, the essence of the uh, common mode rejection you were talking about? Yeah, I find common mode rejection quite interesting and it is definitely something I was not taught at school um, and it was definitely something I haven't really read in an ECG specific textbook. Um, I think it's not until you pick up a how a machine is made textbook that you can start to appreciate what common mode rejection is. And I think if we just break down the words common mode rejection, what it's doing is when we put our electrodes on the patient, 
we have a positive and a negative probe, and it's reading the electricity that travels between them. But like I said, there's also other things going on in the room and other bits of interference that could be the phone in our pocket. It could be the multi, you know, multi-parameter plugged into the mains. Um, so what we do with common mode, what common mode rejection is, is as long as our cables placed around the patient all see the same amount of interference around them, they'll just cancel that bit of interference out because it's seen on both the positive and the negative probe. So our machine just, our ECG machine goes, oh, I can see that on both probes, it's clearly not the activity in the heart because as the electricity travels within the heart from one probe to another probe, we're measuring that difference. So if we have two lots of interference that are on our, um, that are picked up by both electrodes on the patient, then our ECG machine just goes, oh, common cancel it out, common mode rejection. And so why that's important is that when we lay our cables around the patient, if we have our patient sort of laying laterally, for example, um, and we just have these cords splayed all over everywhere, you know, like the, I like to call it the spaghetti junction of cords, all of those cables are technically seeing the interference around them that little bit differently. And therefore, because our ECG machine is trying to find <coughs> You know, it's trying to eliminate what's common. It's trying to just focus on the different way the electricity is moving in the heart towards the positive or negative probe. Um, if we have these spaghetti junction of cables, then our machine is thinking, oh, well, that's different. You know, it's picking it up on the positive, but it's not also picking it up on the negative probe. So therefore, we should put that in our ECG trace because clearly that's electrical activity in the heart because it's different. Um, so if we're able to make our cables see, and I do see in inverted commas, if we're able to make our cables see the same path and same amount of interference because they're all nice and tidy and they're bunched up together, um, then our machine goes, oh, I see that on both of those probes. I'm just going to cancel it out. And it's going to give us a really clean right. looking signal. Yeah. So what you're saying is if, if we make all those cables run together, so they're all, you know, um, touching each other and all parallel rather than spaghetti then that's going to help the machine to get rid of that that interference because it can um cancel it out on both limbs so we just we should keep from what you're saying we should keep those cables all nicely wrapped and up together as close as we can to the point yeah. where they splay out at the animal is that is that what you're saying yeah definitely we just need to tell our machine you know our machine isn't also looking at the patient and then saying oh we'll cancel that little bit of extra noise out from the hind leg cable because i can see that the cable is squibbled around like a worm if we are able to keep our cables really nice and they're nice and tightly together then there's no interference that's picked up by the cape by one cable but it's not picked up by the other and therefore makes it onto our trace so it just helps us get a nice clean trace without interference on it. So just keep them all nice. Um, you know, if we have our plug into the machine and then it goes from the machine down to the patient, we usually have a yoke uh, or, or it splits off into our three or four cabled ECG. And it's from, we've got an insulated part of our cable from the machine often down to the, to the yoke. It's shielded. That's what we call a shielded cable. And then from the yoke where our leads split off, our, our cable split off into three or four, um, those are typically unshielded and that's what we need to make sure is nice and laying nice and tidy. So perhaps we have two cables running alongside each other going to the um, to the forelimbs and then two cables running nice and closely together running to the hind limbs. It's not just splattered all over and crisscrossing over each other. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I think... Um common mode rejection is not something you would normally come across um and 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 i think you know as, as these podcasts you know progress people begin to realize that you know this isn't a theoretical um basis these this really makes a difference i think you had a nice video which obviously we can't share on on this podcast that shows this effect um and it is a real effect isn't it you know it makes a huge difference yeah. to to what you, the quality of what you're getting is that is that video available or can we make it available or we can absolutely make it available talks? No, I think we should. I think it's really interesting. It was something that I I didn't struggle to understand once I saw it and, and I actually ran these cables. You know, we ran these cables over an amplifier just as a source of interference, just over an electrical, over a machine. And in this video, we have them all, we have all four cables bunched up really nicely in just a really nice uniform line. And we hold them over, right over this 
piece of equipment that would give off so much interference. But our ECG line, it's really nice and clean and crisp. Um, and you can see the perfect PQRST. And then we we basically bunch it all up and we have all of the wires crisscrossing over each other. So now our cables aren't seeing the same path anymore, seeing the same amount of interference equally on each cable. And our ECG trace just turns into a bit of a bit of a mess. <laughs> Yeah, so I think we can you. definitely get that that video um, available. I think it would be really nice to share on social media. Yeah, and I think um, that I think you know when I saw that, it highlights really how how real this problem is. And it's not a it's not a theoretical. It's not something you just drag out of a textbook. These these are real um, effects that make a big difference to mm. um, uh, to getting a good ECG. Okay, so. That's that's great. So we now have got good content of the animal. We've got um, you know careful lead control. So we've not got these the spaghetti jumps. We've got nicely laid out wires, and then we're going to go into the machine. But it doesn't stop there either. Because we've got to consider other things like filters and and the setup of the machine. And if that's something that you can sort of um, uh, yeah guide users through as well. I mean filters. I think for me as an electronics engineer, that's fine. I'm absolutely very very happy with filters. But for filters, it's not a concept that really gets taught or it's not something that the, your average vet nurse or vet understands so um, filters are quite important though I believe. Yeah absolutely it's more than just a setting on your ECG machine and I think if you have an ECG machine in your practice or a multi-parameter that has that functionality have a look at the screen and this is something I really didn't look into uh, in some of my parts of my career. I saw, pr simply just attached the ECG and away we went. And if it was bad contact, I just thought, oh, I won't touch, you know, I won't trust it. Um, it's before I had learned about contact, before I'd learned about the cables, and then before I learned about the setting within the machine. So most and most ECG machines will have two filters or two um, settings that you can set it to. So we've usually got monitoring and diagnostic. So if you do have a multi-parameter and ECG in practice, go and have a look at it because I'm sure there'll be these words that you weren't entirely sure that they were there and actually what they mean. Um, and sometimes other machines have, um, you know, that for example, like the mind ray might have another two or so um, types of frequencies. But in terms of what the frequencies actually mean, um, let's focus on the two most common ones. We've got monitoring and diagnostic. Um, and it's really all, correct me if I'm wrong about using this type of terminology, but it's about sort of the bandwidth. If we have our mains, we're all quite familiar with the mains um, is 50 hertz. And we're trying to capture this very fine electrical signal in our heart. Um, <clears throat> but we also don't want to have interference by the mains. We want to just hone into perhaps only up to 35 hertz of electricity. So we're, um, we're not going to, or frequency, sorry. So we're not going to get that mains interference. So if we have a monitoring setting on, we're basically reducing this little window, this little bandwidth that electrical activity can be read by our ECG machine. And then, for example, monitoring is perfect during anesthesia. Um, if we just, we're quite literally monitoring our patient, we're not trying to do anything diagnostic. We just want to see the general morphology of the P, the QRS and the T. And then if we flick over our ECG machine into the diagnostic setting, what that does is it just removes that fine bandwidth and it says, you know, anything with a, um electrical any kind of Hertz measurement, come on through and we'll, we'll display it on the screen. So that's why we really like using it for our diagnostic ECG traces. So those are often in our conscious patients. And that's because we're able to find, like do very fine assessments of, of, of waves and complexes and time. Um, but the diagnostic setting perhaps isn't ideal in a general anesthesia monitoring setting because we have so much other electrical interference going on in the room. So there are two types of filters. And I think if you're having problems with a lot of interference and you've checked your electrodes and your attachments to the patients, you have your cables lined up really nicely and you're eliminating um, all other types of, you know, you're doing common mode rejection. If you are having an ECG trace that is just full of lots of interference, maybe it's not the patient or the cables. Maybe it's because it's picking up on everything else in the room. Um, and maybe it's because it's just plugged into the mains of the wall. Um, so I think it's really important that First of all, that we're aware that our ECG machine has these filters that we can flip between. Um, a really fine bandwidth of monitoring. So we do get most of the um, 
morphologies of you know the PQRST, but we're not going to get a big lot of mains interference. Um, it is quite interesting though that despite this type of filter, even if we have a surgeon that's using diathermy or electrocautery, the moment they try and cauterize something in the patient, uh, that is just such an overwhelming amount of um, electricity that it will just disrupt our ECG regardless. So unfortunately, we don't have a filter on that stops that, but we're usually quite aware when the surgeon's cauterizing. And so I think under anesthesia, it's really important that if we are still having a few problems with there's just so much interference going on, try putting your monitor over from diagnostic onto just the monitoring setting and just try and eliminate everything else that might slip through and come on our ECG trace. So so for monitoring purposes, then we, we have this filter. I think what you're saying, you have a filter that um, it just cuts out the, the, the high noise stuff, the, the, the mains interference and the, the effects of clippers or someone's using clippers, all those sort of things. We can actually filter those out. But by doing so, we if we were trying to do a diagnostic ECG, we might lose some of the fine character of the complex. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think if if we're doing a diagnostic trace, that's when we know we want to really we don't want to have um any kind of patient movement. We don't want to have our phones in our pockets and be in a room where there's a lot of equipment. That's we want a really still patient with no other electronic um electronics around that could interfere and so that's when we have to start talking about keeping our patient nice and calm and leaving your phones out of the room when you go to diagnostic because you're basically inviting you're t turning off all of the filters basically in your machine and you're saying any type of frequency that comes through let's read it and put it on our ecg trace but while we're under anesthesia because we're not really having to do fine measurements or look at the fine waveforms um just the monitoring setting is fine Okay, I think one of the things to note there, and I'm sure this is in, in one of your your talks, is that if you get something like um, you know a bird or a, or or even maybe a cat or or, or a rabbit which has got a very very fast heart rate, and you put the um the, the filter on, you might actually squash the filter uh, the ECG size so much that it's unable to read it. So it's got to be a bit of care because it is a, a 35 hertz filter, and it will actually start to chop down the QRS complexes if they're mm -hmm. very narrow. So yes. I, did, I did quite a lot of bird work and, and you couldn't have the muscle filter on or because it is often termed muscle filter or 35 hertz filter. They use those terms interchangeably. But if you try to, you know, a bird that's got a heart rate of 450 uh, and you put the muscle filter on, your, your trace will sometimes end up like, almost like a squiggle, almost like a flat line. So mm -hmm. we got to be careful. But for our dogs and cats, I think, you know, from what you're saying, that's going to be a very good way to deal with noise to get a nice trace during mm -hmm. our anesthesia. Just in a general it, setting, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, are there any other um, sort of features of the machine that we need to consider to arrive at that nice that nice trace that we were, uh, were striving to get? I think it's important that we have a machine that actually works. So, we should have cables. That works and it, it sounds very simple but if you have a damaged electrical cable trying to read an electrical signal it's it's purely not going to go through up to the machine um so yeah. just like we would do with any other piece of anesthesia equipment we should also just test our ecg machine before we use it especially sometimes if you take off the cables and you throw them on the floor and then someone maybe wheels over it with the table we crunch that wire um, we just need to make sure the equipment's working properly so it sounds quite challenging to to test the ECG cable or test an ECG machine. Is it something that we can do simply? Is it something you know, like we can do a we can do a, a leak test on a anesthetic machine very quickly before or not? Can we do something quick and simple with an, uh, an ECG machine before we use it? Super quick and actually, it's very very easy and it can definitely be built into your pre anesthesia checks. So what we're really trying to do is what you can actually do is just bunch all of your if you hold all of the electrodes in one hand and you attach them all together. So say if you have um, an ECG with crocodile clips, you just have maybe three clips attached to one in particular so that they're all making contact with each other. And then what we should have is a clean flat line because there's nothing to read. There's no there's no difference in any of those cables. And all um, the cables are touching each other, so there's no... All the cables are touching each other. They're not, they're not connected to an hour or anything. We're just connecting them together. Yeah, yep. and in then our we're hand. Just going to see what we get on the on the machine. Yeah, exactly. And so, if we just attach them all the crocodile clips together, not on a patient, um, or if we have the banana plugs, so they would go into 
um, an attachment of an adhesive pad that has a little loop in it. So if you have crocodile clips or banana plugs, which are the very, very common in practice, those two, if you can make them all touch each other, um, then it should be a nice, clean, flat line. Um, and okay. if you don't have a clean flat line, it means one of the cables is seen something different potentially because it's damaged, and that's when it needs to be sent off to be repaired or just replaced. Okay, that sounds like a very simple thing to do. Um, I'm just going to digress a little bit here. Um, you said three cables, um, and I think you know some machines have three cables or three wires, and some have four. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a you know, is there a difference between a machine that has three cables and one? I clearly guess there is between one that has three cables and one that has four cables. Yes. Yeah, so this is when I think sometimes all of the lingo gets a little bit confusing. But you you will have an ECG machine. Typically, if you have a three cabled ECG, you quite often have an electrode that is or a cable that is red, um, yellow and green or red, green and black. Um, and then if you have a machine that has four cables on it, you have a red, yellow, green and a black. So usually in our monitoring, especially under anesthesia, we're typically only reading um, the electrical the differences between two of those cables. And the other one is often just inactive or the grounding cable or a reference electrode. So in our three cable ECG, we are only usually at one only at one time we are looking at the difference in uh, electricity traveling between just two of them. And if we want to change the direction, so if we have something called Einthoven's triangle, um, so if you literally just remember, uh, if you imagine triangular points, we might only be reading from um, from the left just to the right. You know, if we have them on, if we have the green. No, let's start with the yellow. If we have the yellow, which is on the left four, and then we have the red on the right four, and then we have our green or black electrode, um, that's going to be on our hind leg. So if we put that into a perfect triangle across the top of our patient, when we have a three-cabled machine, it means it's only able to ever read at one time between perhaps the left four and the right four or the left four and the hind at one time. And if you want to read differently, we typically read what we call lead two under anesthesia. So if we want to read lead one, which is just the four of them, so between um, the yellow and the red, then we have to go into our machine and then basically almost like flick a switch in our machine and change over to read um, a different lead. However, if you have a four lead ECG, it means we are reading we have basically we have three active electrodes and then a reference electrode and our machine can read up to six traces with that. So we have a, a single channel ECG or we have something that can read up to six traces. So we have our lead one, our lead two, our lead three, and then we have three augmented leads. And actually, if we have a machine that has four cables, it can give us all of those traces, all six traces in one go. So we could look very quickly look at an ECG machine and and determine whether it's a, a six channel or a single channel uh, machine just by the number of cables it's got. So to, and what you're saying, if it's got three cables, it's a single channel. If it's got four cables, it's, it's going to be a, a six channel. A six, right? yeah, exactly, exactly. And I always thought that was quite confusing. I was thinking, well, it you know, if it has four cables, how does it give us six different traces? Um, but I think that's probably easier something teaching that when it's up and we can visualize how everything moves. But definitely, if you have a machine that has three cables, um, it means that you have a single channel ECG and you can look at one lead at a time, either lead one, two or three. Um, and you would have to go into your machine settings and flick between lead one, lead two and lead three. However, if you have a four cable setup, you can simultaneously have all six traces going. And that's just by the nature of the machine. So uh, typically a, a, a diagnostic machine with six channels will allow you to view lead one, two and three simultaneously as part of its function. Is that correct? Yes. Whereas yeah, on absolutely. A single channel, you have to you have to make that change between them. You're going to have to go into your machine settings and then you will look for the channel um, or the lead and you'll be able to change between lead one, two or three. But yeah, if you have a four cable machine, then you can just have them all up simultaneously because they are all active We've got so three we, active electrodes. We digressed a bit. We came came to that from our, our ECG cable testing. So we did a very simple test. I think you said there was another test. So we, we can do a test on um, putting all the cables together, whether that's three lead or even, even 
four sorry three cable or four cable um mm -hmm. there's another test i think you were you were going to describe as well of how we can test our cables or our ecg machine um in terms of testing them individually what cable or has fallen off i think i think from what you said the we can test our cables and then we you know we know that if we got a flat line that, that they're all okay there's no breaks in those cables and then we can put them on the patient and we could be we could be having a, a good monitoring session but then suddenly start to see interference and, and is there a way that we could kind of glean from where that interference is appearing whether any of those cables in in a monitoring or have fallen off. set up it's fallen off or, or it could be faulty or even just mm -hmm. trying out because it's not uncommon is it you know you set everything up you got a lovely ecg on your cat and then 15 minutes later you start to get a lot of noise um <laughs> And, and is there some way we can determine where that noise is coming from? Yeah, absolutely. So if we, we have, we've got three tests that we can do basically. So in the first test that I described, you connect all of the cables together. You make all of the crocodile clips touch each other or you make all of the banana, you know, the banana plugs touch each other. And then you should just have a nice clean flat line as you move through lead one, lead two and lead three because they're all seeing the same thing. It's all just one big flat line. Yeah. Another test, so if we call this test two, this is a test that you can do prior to placing them onto the patient, and that will help localize which cable might be faulty. So if you fan, if you hold them all cables, whether you have a three or four cable um, machine, if you just hold them all in one hand, but you're not touching, you're just holding the cable, you're not actually touching the um, electrode attachment, and then to do these tests, you do need to have that kind of understanding on lead one reads between the right four and the left four. So that is the red and the yellow cable. So if you put your machine into lead one, into lead one channel, if you touch the right four and the left four electrode, which will be the red and the yellow one, you'll get interference on your ECG machine because you're you're just introducing a bit of interference, which is you. You're wiggling it, um, and therefore it's going to sense that and go, "Hoi, there we go. There's a bit of noise and interference on our ECG tray." So this is what you're doing before you attach it to the patient. So when you appreciate that lead one involves the right four and the left four, so the the yellow and the red, if you touch either one of those, you should get interference. Um, if you touch either one of those and you don't get interference, it means the machine's not picking up the electrode that you've set the machine to read. Um, so therefore, you, you have a fault in those in one of those cables. If you touch the left hind or the right hind cable, so the green or the black, they're not involved in a lead one reading. So there should be nothing happening on your screen. And then if you move into and you set your machine into lead two, so you change the channel, you change the lead into lead two. We know that lead two involves the right four, so the red, and then the left hind, so the green cable. So that means if you touch either one of those cables, you should get interference on your ECG machine. We've got two other or one or two, depending on what configuration you have. So in a lead two ECG setup, we're not... Um, active, we know the inactive electrode is the yellow one, so that's the left four. And then if you do have a four cable ECG where you have the right hind, which is the black one, if you touch either one of those, you're not really going to get much of a response because we know that the only active electrodes when we're in lead two is the green and the red. So therefore, if we touch them, we should get a response. Um, and then if we don't, we know that the machine's not picking up on that bit of interference. So therefore, the cable must be broken. And then okay. the same again, if we move on to lead three, um, in lead three, we use the left four, so the yellow, and then we read the, the activity between that electrode and then the left hind, so that's the green. So it means if we touch the yellow or the green when we've got our machine set to lead three, we should get interference when we touch and we wiggle that. And also if we go and touch the right four, which isn't involved, so the red electrode, if we go and touch that one that isn't involved in lead three reading, when we're set to read lead three, it means you won't get any kind of interference. Okay, so I think what you've, what, what's coming out of this is that, um, you know, if you have um, several leads, not, not cables, but leads on a machine, lead one, lead two, lead three, at any point, only two cables are involved. So lead one is red and yellow, and uh, lead two is red and green. Um, and, and if you're on lead two, viewing it um then the the left or the yellow one isn't involved nor is the black so i think from, from yeah you know, it, it starts to make sense doesn't it that if you are on a certain lead on your uh your machine 
and you touch the ones that are involved with that lead, you should get noise or movement or stylus moving up and down or 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 lots of you know noise on your ECG screen. When I say noise, I mean a lot a lot of electrical activity flipping up mm-hmm. and down, um, mm-hmm. but not on the other two. So I think all we need to remember then is is our is our Eindhoven's triangle, which we all got taught and all remember. Um, and and then we just know what lead one is, you know, red, yellow, and lead two is red, green, and lead three is yellow, green. Um, mm-hmm. And the others shouldn't be involved. So that's quite a neat test to do. It's very, it very sounds like a very quick test that we can do prior to um, to putting them on, yeah. on the animal. And, and I think you said Absolutely. there was one more test. Yeah, so we've got another test. So those first two tests that I've described, those are ones that you can do prior to placement on the, on the patient, and that's just making sure everything's in working order. Um, as I said, the first one's very easy, but it doesn't actually tell us – it just tells us all of the cables are working. It doesn't tell us what cable might be a fault, which is what test two does. You go through and you touch each um, ele- you know, you touch each electrode, depending on if you're set to lead one, two, or three. That's fine, but commonly we're losing contact. Our electrodes dry off. Um, they dry out. Our surgeon pulls the leg and the crocodile clip um, pops off the patient and suddenly we don't have an ECG trace anymore. And what you could do is go underneath the drapes and you could go around to each one of your electrodes and make sure it's actually all attached to your patient, which isn't always a favorite for some of the surgeons. They kind of just want you out from underneath the drapes um, because they just want to you know, get things done. Um, so there is actually, if everything was attached and wasn't was working nice and normally prior to placement, you can now, with the knowledge of the Eindhoven's triangle and the, you know, the way that lead one reads between red and yellow and lead two reads between um, red and green and lead three reads between yellow and green, what you can do is knowing that they were all on the patient perfectly fine before perhaps the surgeon went and moved things or the bear hugger managed to dry out an electrode, is you can, instead of going underneath the drapes to try and find what one of the four cables has fallen off, you can actually use your machine to localise exactly what cable it is so that you only have to go under the drapes once and you're only under there for five minutes while you tape it back in place or you clip it back in or you apply a bit more spirit. And to do that, um, if your trace becomes quite, so you've got your three traces, you've got lead one, lead two, and lead three, and you appreciate, for example, in lead one, um, that we we have the right four electrode and the left four electrode, they are the active ones. So that means in lead one, um, the trace, if one of those has fallen off, it's going to be blurry um, because those are the two active electrodes involved. It means if we flick over to lead two, lead two electrodes are the right four and the left hind. So if one of those ones have fallen off, um, it's going to be a bit of a fuzzy trace. And we're able to, you know, if we have the difference between lead one and lead two, the common electrodes in lead one and lead two are the right four. So if we have a squiggly uh, ECG trace on lead one and two, we know that it's the right four that's fallen off. If we then flick over to lead three, those electrodes are the left four and the left hind. So the right four is not involved. So that means we're going to have a really nice crisp trace. So therefore we know it's not going to be the left four or the left hind electrode that's going to, that has fallen off or dried. It's going to be the right four because that's the common electrode in both lead one and two. So you know you just need to go under the drapes and just go straight for the right four. You know it's not the left four because you tried that out in lead three and it worked perfectly. So therefore you know you can localize it then to the to the red electrode. So you just have to go under the drape once. Yeah. So it's a little a little sort of detective game, isn't it? So you, it is. It's fun. You just uh, look at take, you just look at the, <laughs> the the noisy traces, and by elimination, you see which is common to those two traces. Yeah. Because typically, I think what you're saying there, two traces out of three are going to be noisy, and the one that yes. isn't noisy has got the two good electrodes, and the other yeah. ones are going to have uh, have one common electrode to both of those, which is going to be the noisy one, which is probably yeah. because it's it, the, the spirit has dried up or the the um, sticky pad is starting to peel away or or whatever. But that's going to indicate the fault. So that, those, are, those are three quite nice tests, aren't they, to to do um, to sort of um, A, know your machine's working. If it isn't working, to identify a fault and B, to help you identify where, where things are going wrong in a surgery if it's difficult to get access to those electrodes so yes. that, that, i think that's that, yeah that's very very helpful yeah um so um we've talked a lot about 
you know, getting good signals. So we, we've got our good skin contact. We know how paramount, how, how very important mm-hmm. it is to get that contact, the cables, the use of filters, and the, and the sort of um, testing of leads. So we should have all the elements that lead up to us getting a really nice ECG. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, uh, this is something that I feel doesn't really get covered either, you know. What are the the steps you need to get a really good ECG? Because now at this stage, now now we've got an ECG that we actually think is going to be uh, useful and clean and diagnostic, so we can start to to make some assessment on it. Because I mean, I don't know how you feel, but my my feeling is, unless you've got a, a nice you know tidy ECG, you can't begin to make assessment because noise could look like anything. Noise could look like aging, yeah. fibrillation. Yeah, noise could look like exactly fibrillation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it is important, isn't it, to go through these steps to to get to um, yeah, having a very reliable ECG. And this applies you know, to monitoring as well as diagnostic, almost more to diagnostic. If you want a really good diagnostic ECG, you've got to lay all the groundwork to get that, um, that trace looking as good as possible. Yes, it's not just a matter of plugging it in and away we go. There's so much more to make sure or to give you confidence of what's happening on the ECG trace is actually what's happening to your patient. It's not everything else in the room that's interfering with it or or the yeah. settings are wrong on your machine. So having sort of gone through all this procedure, I think you know, we're at the point where we could talk about ECGs and then what they start to mean. I think that's really the, the subject of another podcast. So mm-hmm. but just to kind of sort of wrap this one up, um, is there, you know, what would be your take home message for people, you know, st- you know, facing doing an ECG. I think some some people, you know, get concerned and they oh, I got an ECG and and it's a lottery as to how it works. So um what would be your sort of take home message for those those guys that uh, are facing those dilemmas and those anxieties about getting ECGs um to to follow a um sort of protocol to get a good ECG every time. What would you advise them? I think if you uh, in terms of some take home points, just take each part of the machine um, if you just break it all down, it's all very fair and well saying, just minimize resistance and and just make sure your settings right. I think if we just start right down at the electrodes, just make sure they've got really good contact with the patient, add some gel, add some spirit, clean the pores, um, dampen the fur, uh, just make sure there's really good, that signal that gets from the heart to the skin, it's very, very small, which is why we have an ECG with an amplifier to then make it big again so that we can actually interpret it. So the contact between the patient and the electrodes needs to be very clean with as much resistance eliminated as possible. So once we've dealt with the electrodes, let's move on up to the cables. The take-home point about the cables is have them lying nice and uniformly, nice and tidy together. Um, Make sure they all see the same amount of interference so that the machine knows what to cancel out of the trace and what what is actually the activity in the heart. Um, And also just have your machine set to the right setting. So we most commonly read lead two under anesthesia, but just be mindful that even if you have it set to lead two, but you perhaps have a diagnostic filter on in a very busy theater, you might start to pick up lots of other bits of interference in the room. So just make sure that if you are having problems with your trace, you perhaps flick it over to monitoring. And if you're still having problems, it should eliminate mains interference. But if you are having still quite a problem with um, interference as well, just try unplugging your machine from the wall and running on battery, um, taking your phones out of the pocket, out of your pocket. Um, and I think one of the last take-home points, which is very important, is just to make sure that it's clean and it's maintained. You can't get traces off dirty. If you can't get a, a good trace off a dirty patient with dirty pores, then you can't get um, a nice ECG trace off equipment that's also dirty, that has dried gel, or perhaps the crocodile clips have gone really rusty. So just make sure the equipment's nice and cleaned. And by maintaining your equipment, it's just treating those cables really nicely and not perhaps throwing them on the floor. Just have a nice loose coil when you tidy up the cables at the end of the day. Um, or you can just hang up your cables on a hook. Just look after the cables as well. Well, thank you, Courtney. I think that's, you know, um, been really helpful for people uh, because a lot of these things don't get discussed. And I think that that's a shame because it has such a profound effect on the ability to get uh, a good ECG trace. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I think uh, we've got coming up in some of the podcasts in the future, we're going to be talking about uh, dead space and some sort of lung capacity um, figures. I think we all we all remember those charts at uh, college about um, lung volumes. We really want to look into what they mean. We want to look into what 
dead space actually means for the patient. And also we've been talking about things like hypothermia. So lots of interesting topics coming up. But thank you for today. And um, we'll, we'll speak to, uh, to you in the future. And um, thanks for, for being here. Great. No problem. We'll talk soon. OK, thank you. Bye now. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast. Don't forget to follow our podcast to stay up to date with the latest episodes. And feel free to share this with your team. If you have any questions or feedback for us or simply want to know more about what you've just heard, please feel free to send us an email at clinicalsupport at burtons.uk.com. Thanks for listening and catch you next time.